Go ahead. Okay, first off, we just wanted to start by saying thank you for everyone to coming down here. Um, it means a lot to us that you're here to watch us. Today we're going to be talking about our year-long STEM capstone presentation called the Tone Drum, also known as the car that couldn't fly. First, a little bit about ourselves, though. Um, my name is Emma. I am an officer in Women in STEM. I was on the Vex Robotics team this year. I've done TSA, National Honor Society, Destination Imagination. I've been a youth basketball coach, and I've played competitive basketball and soccer for most of my life. I am also involved at choir here at Grandview, and in the fall, I'll be at the University of Iowa studying biomedical engineering. I'm Taylor. I share a lot of similar activities with Emma. I'm an officer in women in STEM. I was on the VEX Robotics team. I do TSA, FBLA, NHS. I'm involved in the theater here through carpentry and automation. Um, I did Destination, Destination Imagination and I'm co-chair of the leadership committee. And I played basketball, coached youth basketball, and I have an internship at Aerospace Cape, at, um, Cape Atlanta Aerospace. And in the fall, I'm happy to say I'll be attending the University of Colorado Boulder to study aerospace engineering. Let's go bus. <laughs> a couple of things that helped us figure out what we wanted to do with this project were our past experiences working on other similar things. In middle school, we were on a destination imagination team where we 3D printed and built our own drone. We also have a lot of experience working with Arduino and different sensors. We've taken various tech and engineering classes here through Grandview. And last year, we did animatronics through TSA. So all of that really helped us figure out that we wanted to do something with Arduino to help improve our knowledge of what that was like and help build off of our past experiences with drones. Another thing that really helped us figure out what we wanted to do for our project is the fact that Emma and I are both very big movie buffs. We spent a lot of time in my basement just binging movies, so a lot of it came from Guardians of the Galaxy. How many of you have seen the movie Guardians of the Galaxy? Awesome. So there's a guy named Yondu in that movie who has an arrow that flies around when he whistles. We wanted to create something similar through the form of a drone. So this drone would change direction in the air based off whistling pitches done by people like us. And for all of you that haven't seen it, we had a video. Just imagine, oh there we go, okay, <laughs> awesome. Um, this is a clip from a movie. Um, he whistles and his little arrow flies around. Obviously ours will be a little less complex than his, <laughs> but that's the basic idea that we wanted to try to follow. Um, at the beginning of the year, we had to set some project objectives for ourselves that we wanted to meet by this time. A lot of what we wanted to do stemmed from improving our knowledge of coding. Both of us have taken AP Computer Science Principles. Taylor took it her freshman year, and I'm in it this year, so our knowledge wasn't very extensive before this project. We also wanted to improve our SOLIDWORKS skills, learn more about weight distribution and aerodynamics, as well as how transmitter and radio waves work, and improve our whistling abilities, which ironically are not good. <laughs> we also had some final outcomes that we set for this project. Our overall one was to create a drone that runs autonomously, but we also needed to create a code that could take whistle pitches and get it to do a function for our drone. And then similar to that, create a code that could take input from the sound sensor and then get a physical outcome from it. And if there was time, we wanted to make this drone resemble Yondu's arrow from Guardians of the Galaxy, which would have to do with some more weight and balance things. Our original timeline, we deviated from quite a bit in the end, but we had planned semester one to be mainly researching what we're going to do with our code and coding everything, and then semester two was a lot of physically setting everything up and testing it and troubleshooting. This changed a lot, however, because we had a lot of challenges and setbacks. One of our setbacks with our receiver set us back actually multiple months in the design process, which ultimately ended up changing our final outcome for our project. And combining that with our sound sensor and just all the components that we had to deal with set us back months from where we wanted to be. So all of this just altered our timeline a lot. A part of our project was we had to have a team of advisors. Our first expert advisor is Professor Kevin Horschersberger, whose name I definitely just butchered, so I apologize. He is a professor at Virginia Tech, and he specializes in automated systems and drone-related technologies. Our next advisor is our very own Mr. Barker. <laughs> Mr. Barker is a computer science teacher here at Grandview High School, and we've gotten to work with him a lot over the past two years, as he's also the advisor for Women in STEM, Robotics, and TSA. And he helped us a lot with this project with our code and emotional support overall, not only for the project, but just getting through senior year. We had four support advisors. The first one was the Society of Women Engineers at CU Boulder. Then we had Rachel Fox, who is a junior at Colorado School of Mines. We wanted to give a special thank you for driving all the way down here today. Um, then we have Kevin Rofi, who is an Air Force General. 
um, and was our DI team manager, so we've had a lot of experience working on Arduino projects with him in the past. And then Keith Heidebrecht, which is Taylor's dad, who is a software engineer and helped us with our code and emotional financial support. <laughs> Um, because of the very ambitious project that we took on, we had to break our project down into very simple components to, us, to start, which was just whistling. Whistling is just a bunch of sound waves that go through it, so we needed a physics calculation to get that frequency into like different numbers that we could print. There's a, um, a program called Fourier Transform that will do this for us. It's just a physics operation that will do all the calculations for us to separate everything into their frequencies. We originally tried to just use our computer as what was intaking our sound because they already had built-in microphones to them, but we were having a bunch of problems with this from the very start, which you're going to hear a lot this presentation, um, just because we couldn't download all the libraries that we needed to, so we knew that we needed to go a different route very quickly. And this is the route that we decided to take. We found a sound sensor that would work really well for us. This sound sensor just takes an analog input in the form of your whistling and gets a digital output in the form of a number that it prints for us. And this works really well for us because we can set it up directly with our Arduino board, which we already know how to use. This is the basic code for it. It just sets up a library. These libraries are already made in Arduino IDE for us, so it was really easy to utilize. And then it would input from the sound sensor and put it through for your transform to then output a value in our serial monitor. This is the physical setup for it. It was a really simple setup for this because it's just a sound sensor. So it's a sound sensor, a breadboard, and just an Arduino board. Okay, while we were looking into what sound sensors we wanted to use and how to set everything up for that, we were also looking at what transmitter and receiver we wanted. We came across two main options that we thought would work. The only real difference between the two was that the first one could transmit over a distance of about 100 meters, and the second one was only about 15 to 25. We did end up going with the second one because we knew we didn't need that big of a range just to prove what we wanted to do. And there was also a lot more examples of people using this type of transmitter on Arduino forums and YouTube. So it, we knew it would be a lot of help with troubleshooting and setting it up in the first place. This is the initial code we made for the transmitter and receiver. On the left is going to be the receiver code, and the right is the transmitter code. The first part of each is just saying which pins, each, which pins are in the board that connect to each. And then the bottom of the receiver is a statement that tells it to read whatever the transmitter sent. And the bottom of the transmitter code is just telling it to send a value. This is the physical setup for both. We plan to have our transmitter on the same board as our sound sensor, and then we have an Arduino Nano for the receiver, which we were planning to put on our drone because of its smaller size. After we had this, we wanted to go into some rounds of testing. And off the bat, we already hit some problems. You're going to hear a lot, this didn't work. <laughs> for this one, already it didn't work. We were just testing the sound sensor at this point, just making sure that it could input a value and then print something in our serial monitor. And when we tried this, nothing happened. There are no errors in our code, but nothing was taking place. We quickly figured out, this was one of our, our more simple problems, that just the bond value here was not lining up with the one that we set in our code. So once we lined up the ones to match on our serial monitor and in our code, we got that to work. Okay, once we had one value printing for a sampling period, we knew we wanted to be able to gather multiple values for each period, just because when you have something flying around or moving, you want it to be able to continually take directional information so it's not just stuck going one way forever. We tried to do this at first by creating a loop in our code. That, we ran into a lot of issues trying to do that. We did try several times. We were talking to our advisor, Mr. Barker, and nothing was working. Eventually, we started reaching the specific syntax we were supposed to use and figured out that we were not coding in some sort of Python version like we thought we were, and it was actually Arduino's own variation of C++. So once we figured out the correct syntax, we put in the loop again and everything started working. We felt very smart after that one. <laughs> after we had this working, we wanted to go ahead and add a few more components to test. We wanted to get a physical outcome from our sound sensor, which means we needed to know what values to put in our code and our if statements. This turned out to be a little more challenging than we thought. We thought we could just play a frequency from our phone and put that same frequency in our code. But the frequency we played was a different number that was being outputted on our serial monitor, and so we had to do some testing to figure out what that number truly was. And once we figured that out, we could put it in our code. And with our code for our physical setup, we wanted to utilize a servo. Um, we worked with servos a lot in the past, so just for testing purposes, getting our sound sensor to input a value, and then if that value was a certain number, turn the servo. However, that didn't work. <laughs> Originally, when we tried to put the servo in our code, we used something we had from a previous project, 
that went off of a light sensor trying to turn a servo. And that project worked fine. So at first, we were really confused as to why it wasn't working. So we started trying to call on the data printed by the serial monitor, and then we tried to call on the data after it was put in the list, and nothing was working. Turns out it was another syntax problem because we weren't super familiar with the variation C++ we were using. And once we did that, we got the servo to turn. At this point in our project, we had three different codes. We had one for our transmitter, one for our receiver, and then one for our servo and sound sensor. And we knew we needed to get it down to two codes where our transmitter was with our sound sensor and our receiver was with our servo. This is our code for putting those together. We just kind of meshed the codes that we already had together to try to get them to work. So it's just setting up the transmitter, setting up the sound sensor, and then once the sound sensor, sound sensor outputs that value, it'll go ahead and send that from the transmitter to the receiver. And this is a similar um, receiver code. It just takes that value found from the transmitter and tells the servo to turn if it's a certain value. Okay, once we had all of both of these codes made, we had to download them to our boards, which if you've been here for any of the pre previous presentations, a lot of our classmates had a similar struggle. When we went to try to download our code on our Arduino Nano, it wasn't working. It just wouldn't download. We, don't, we didn't really know why at first. Our code was compiling just fine, which means that there wasn't any errors in the way we wrote it. So we started changing the port number, the programmer, and eventually figured out that we had a specific type of nano that was a nano every. And even after we changed that the first time on our boards manager, it still wouldn't download. We finally got it to work when we figured out the Arduino every had its own programmer that we needed. After we did this, we went into some more testing. We wanted to make sure that it worked all together. We had all of our components working separately, so theoretically it should work together, right? It didn't, shocker. Um, everything stopped working. We couldn't get anything to print in our serial monitor. We couldn't get the servo to turn, and we couldn't find any errors in our code, so we were just really complex on like, what was happening. And this is when we reached out to our advisor, Kevin Rothy, to help us. He's had a lot of experience with these sort of things in the past, and so we um, tried to get some help to figure out how to troubleshoot this. We first troubleshooted it by checking the wires. He has a lot of experience with this happening, and so do we have just wires getting switched up when you're plugging them in. So first we checked that all of that was working properly, and then we wanted to try some other things. The first one was taking out a while statement from our code. We had a while statement within an if statement, and we weren't sure if that would be causing any redundancies to make conditions not be met. So we took that out just to be safe. And our next step was adding a capacitor to our transmitter. We wanted to make sure it was getting a stable power supply in case that was one of the problems that was happening because we couldn't find one in our code. And then another one, just adding a serial print statement to our receiver. This would just print the value that it was being received from from the transmitter just to make sure that it was receiving something. Okay, while we were trying to figure out what was happening with our transmitter and receiver, we did what our advisor, Kevin Rothy, calls code hack. And we started putting in print statements wherever we thought something might be happening with our code that could be causing it to fail, just to double check that all our parameters were being met. Eventually, we did get this to work, and we got our transmitter just to send a set value. In this example, it's 100 to our receiver, and it would print on our receiver's serial monitor. Another side problem we kept having with this was our Arduino Nano was in a breadboard to connect to other wires, and it kept popping out of the breadboard for some reason. It just didn't want to stay in, which all of a sudden it would stop printing, and you wouldn't know why, and then after we knew that the transmitter and receiver were communicating with each other on their own, and we also knew that the sound sensor and the servo were, were working, we tried to put it all together again to test it again. But when we tested it, nothing happened. And so we knew that the issue had to be with how the codes were combined because everything was working on its own. So we added in some more print statements to figure out where conditions were failing, but all of our conditions that we tried were being met, so we were still unable to figure out what was happening. And so while we brainstormed this with our advisors, we went in to do some more research as we were already falling behind. Since we knew we were falling behind where we wanted to be on our original timeline, we started looking at motors at this point too. We were also playing with the idea of not using a flight controller for our drone, which if you don't know what a flight controller is, it just helps it stay stable in the air. Um, and we just wanted to see if we could connect our Arduino directly to the motors, which we will talk about a little bit more about why that made us <laughs> switch to a car. Um, we also figured out that our DC motors couldn't be powered directly by the Arduino board, so we needed an outside power source. And that diagram up there we made on Tinkercad, you can see we have a battery pack hooked up to a transistor to help control power to the motor. 
We quickly figured out that this wasn't going to work for us. That setup needed the use of, use of a transistor because it didn't have enough power. But that transistor, how that works is it just sends bursts to the motor to turn it on and off repeatedly at a very quick speed. And this makes the motor have a constant speed as it's flying. But in order to make our drone turn, we need to be able to control the speed of it to slow one side down and speed one side up to make it turn. We did some more research to figure out how we could combat that, and we found a brushless motor and, ele and an electric speed controller. Those are often used in drones to just control the speed of the drone in which it's flying. So we thought that this would be a good option moving forward. Around this time, we have our mid-year advisor meeting with Professor Kevin. Um, overall, his feedback was that we should look at deviating from our original plan to make a drone. Uh, his input was that making a drone without a flight controller would be dangerous to fly around. <laughs> he felt that um, we would be better off creating a drone that didn't fly and you could just see the motor spin to get the proof of concept of changing direction, or we could create a ground vehicle. We ultimately decided to go with the ground vehicle to get a more satisfying result from all of this. We really wanted to have a physical setup that could move based off of all the work we did. And from this point on, we said a lot to ourselves, it's just proof of concept. After this, we went back to the very basics. We still couldn't figure out what was happening between our transmitter and receiver, so we switched our Nano to an Uno. We weren't very familiar with the Nanos, and we had problems with it before, so we switched it just to make sure that this wasn't one of the reasons that we were having problems. Right after we switched it, we started getting the transmitter to be able to communicate to the receiver again, and just to make sure we could make a physical outcome happen from that value that was being set, we put an LED on the receiver board and the value it would get from the transmitter would turn the light on and off. We then did the same thing with the transmitter. We added a light to make sure that it was sending values we, values we wanted. And this also eliminated the need for a servo on either boards, which could also be causing us issues because there's so much other code and library that goes along with the servo. Another side issue we ended up having that turned into a pretty big roadblock for us was while all this was happening, we went back just to check in on our sound sensor code, make sure everything was still printing right, and shocker, it was not working. It would print a couple values and then start printing not in the serial monitor, which for those of you who know code means not a number. It took us forever to figure out why this was happening, and we started asking our classmates who have a little bit more experience in code, and figured out that it was an overflow problem with our sampling period, and even after figuring that out, we still didn't know how to fix it, so we scrapped all of that and went back to the very original code we had with it. Once we went back to our original sound sensor code, magically everything was working again. We don't know why it stops, what happens, but once we got back to our original, it was working. So we decided to try to simplify it a little bit. We still wanted to get our transmitter and receiver to work together along with our sound sensor, so we thought simplifying what the receiver had to go through would help us. So we tried just putting in an if statement in the transmitter code to only send the peak values from the sound sensor if it was within a certain range. And this would lessen the amount of code that the receiver was having to go through and scan through to try to find the right values. But when we did this, nothing happened. Um, after we talked with our advisor, Mr. Barker, he made it seem really simple on what to do. We were just eating lunch one day and he like had this epiphany to us. And it was just to create a new variable. So in the transmitter code, we said if the value of peak is within a certain range, set a new variable equal to 100. We knew that the value 100 could be sent from the transmitter to the receiver with no problem. So we thought that this would simplify it for us and eliminate any redundancies that could be happening. But again, it didn't work. Okay, so at this point we went back to putting in more print statements to print things for our serial monitor so we knew where our conditions weren't being met. And we found that a specific loop in our code, the condition wasn't ever being met. So we knew we, the problem was something in there. And as a last kind of resort, we plugged everything into ChatGPT because we couldn't figure it out. At this point, we'd been spending months trying to get the transmitter and receiver to work. And ChatGPT found the problem. Um, there's a variable in our code that helps set up the sampling period we have. And it was always being initialized to zero when it should have been being initialized to milliseconds in our code, which caused the <laughs> caused the value in our sampling period to exceed what Arduino could handle and was causing the not issue. This is us right after figuring out the solution to it in our classroom. Um, if you can put it in our sort of perspective, we had spent months trying to figure this out. Our project, we had to change the outcome because of it, and it was because one tiny little line of code was being set to zero instead of milliseconds. So it was very frustrating for us to figure out, but very happy moment. 
This is our transmitter and receiver code that actually works. Um, so this is the code that will take a value from the sound sensor, run it through Fourier transform to get a peak value, and then use the transmitter to send it over to the receiver. And then this is our working receiver code. This just reads whatever value it's sent from the transmitter and then uses it to turn an LED light on and off. After we had all of our code working how we wanted it to, we really needed to move on to our whole physical setup. We were months behind, and so this was probably around the end of March, beginning of April, when we started building our physical models. So we needed to move quickly. So we found these motors that would work really well for us. They came with the wheels, and they worked with Arduino really well, so it was an easy solution for us to use with our car. And then these use a motor driver, and these motor drivers um, just help control the speed and power to the motors. While we were waiting for our motors and motor driver board to arrive, we started designing our car body in SOLIDWORKS, and we 3D printed it to be able to hold our breadboard, our receiver, our Arduino Uno, and the motor driver board and motors. After we had all of our materials here, the next thing to do was setting it up. One of the motor driver boards can control two motors, and we had two motor boards, so we wanted to make our car four-wheel drive. However, one of the wires coming from the motor driver had to be connected to a special pin in our Arduino board in order to control the speed. Unfortunately, after we set up one of our motor drivers, we ran out of pins in our Arduino board, and we couldn't put the second one on. At this point, we didn't have time to order another Arduino board that had more pin numbers for us, so we decided to just make our car two-wheel drive, front-wheel drive, and we ran an axle through the back two wheels. After we got everything physically set up with the motors and all the wiring to the boards, we started playing around with how we were going to code them. The first thing we got to work was getting them to spin both in the same direction. Then we focused on being able to get them to change direction, and we did this by switching which pin for each motor received power. And after that, we got the motors to be able to change speed. After all of that, we started incorporating our transmitter and receiver. At this point, we were at Taylor's house in the basement <laughs> working again, so we didn't have our sound sensor code because it was downloaded on a school computer, and we couldn't get the libraries to download on our personal computers for some reason. So we ended up just making a very basic transmitter code that sent one value to the receiver that we used to turn the wheels different directions. And then we would go in and manually change the value the transmitter was sending, and then re-download it to our board every time. After we had all of that, we started on our physical side, just getting everything attached, screwing our wheels into our board that we designed, and getting everything set on top of it. In the bottom left corner, that's the motor driver connected to the Arduino and the breadboard. And then here you can see it all set up on our car. And we ran it with the motors first, just to make sure that our code was working okay with our motors. At this point, we were once again back at my house, trying to work on how to do this. We had all of our code with us. We had the physical setup of our car. So we just had to download the code and run. No, it stopped working again. We couldn't figure out why. We had all of our code working right before this, and all we changed was putting the motors on our setup. So we went back through all of our code, but still couldn't figure out what was happening. We did some code hack, put some print statements, trying to figure out what was happening, and eventually found that no matter what the transmitter was sending to the receiver, the receiver was always printing the zero, no matter what. And we didn't know why. All of our code was set up the exact same way. When we tested it, Earlier it had worked and nothing was amiss. So as a last Hail Mary, afters, hours after we tried fixing all of this, we decided to just, just replace the receiver, see if maybe randomly it had stopped working. And apparently that was the problem. It just magically stopped. And then once we replaced it, it worked. <laughs> this is part two of us crying on the floor again. After we spent hours trying to change our code and finally figured out it was because the receiver board just decided to give up. This was the very first time we got it to run. Um, we were at my house, we just replaced the receiver, and we got it to drive for the very first time. We hadn't adjusted the values yet in our code, so it was just driving forward at this point, but honestly, we were happy we got anything to work whatsoever at this point. <laughs> okay, after we finally got it driving, we had a physical car that actually moved, we wanted to be able to make it change directions. This was relatively simple compared to everything else we've done in our project so far. It just required us adding a few more if statements into our receiver code that specified if a value was like between 100 or 200 or like 300 or 400, the car would go forward or backwards or turn left or right. Once we did this and we had it working how we wanted it to, our last thing was to create something for our transmitter device. We didn't have anything to hold it and we wanted to put all of our breadboards in one place with the sound sensor. 
So we created this little box that just has a hole in it where the sound sensor is, so it can still receive input from whistling. We designed a model of this and printed it three total times. The first two times, it broke because there are just flimsy parts of it. Emma and I's SolidWorks skills are subpar at best, so we had to have Mr. Combs come over and help design it for us. Um, he helped us get a better, more sturdy model and print it with a better material, and he gives his approval in the bottom right corner. <laughs> Overall, we learned a lot from this project. Some of the main things that we were able to take away is a little bit more knowledge about coding, especially C++ and that Arduino does not use Python. Um, also, a little more about how to use receivers and transmitters and how to get those to work with physical models. We learned a little bit more about SolidWorks and how to design more structurally sound pieces. We also were able to improve our knowledge of motor drivers and driver boards just to figure out how to control different motor speed and directions. We also improved our research and time management skills a lot. It's a lot when you have to re like record every single website you visit during a project and put it in a bibliography. And the time management piece, it gets really hard when you create a timeline at the beginning of the year and you start falling away from it and just staying calm and staying on track and being able to have a finished project at the end was a big piece to us. This also helped grow our coffee addiction. <laughs> Back to our goals that we wanted to complete at the beginning, one of our original goals was just to create a code that could get um, signals from the sound sensor and then somehow have it have um, directional changes to it. And I think we very well accomplished this goal. We had our sound sensor take outputs to then send to the receiver that would get us physical outputs. We also wanted to be able to get our code to take input from a different board to be able to tell it which direction to go in. And while it's not a drone, we still are able to control the direction our car moves based off of input from the transfer. And then our really like time constraining goal was just to make it shaped like Yandu's arrow from Guardians of the Galaxy. Obviously it's not a drone shaped arrow, an arrow shaped drone, but we still did get to design everything on our own. Everything on there we designed in SolidWorks from the shape of it to like what material we used. So we're really happy that we still got to have some sort of design aspect to our project. Our last overarching goal was to create a drone that could run autonomously. And while we do not have a drone, we are still very proud of our car that couldn't fly. This is a video of our final outcome. Um, in the left one you can see we're just using a frequency generator app. When we play a high pitch, it drives forward. When we switch that pitch to be lower, it'll start driving backwards. And because neither of us can whistle very well, we are using my phone. This video on the right is actually Emma doing the whistling, and um, we got our car to turn slightly on hardwood floor. Still can't turn on carpet, but it'll make strides to turn on hardwood if you really try for it. <laughs> I bet you know how annoying our classmates got with us when we did the <laughs> And then we did a little photo shoot with our car. This is the final outcome that we had. Not a drone, but still a very fun outcome for us to have. And then here's our bibliography. Thank you all for coming again. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Uh, if you had like another mother's, would you try to make it into a drone? We might need a little longer than a month or two, just because creating a flight controller, as we figured out, is a long process. I, we feel that we could do it if we had enough time, but we need more than a month or two. And what about increasing with a uh, army? We, we talked about doing that, but there's just so many complexities between getting an existing flight controller to work with all of our code and all of our setup, which is something that we have to do a lot more research on. But when talking with our advisor who from Virginia Tech who specializes in that, he said it's like a very long class that he even teaches. So figuring that out on our own within the span of a few months was not just applicable for us. Yeah, Bella? Um, we are really big movie buffs, and Gal Guardians of the Galaxy is one of our favorite movies. And while researching what we wanted to do for this project, we came across some people like Mark Rober on YouTube, and there was one who specialized in making Marvel-related technology, and we thought it was really cool and wanted to do something similar. All the applications that we use are very applicable to other things outside of like a little car um, and its way. All the Arduino we learned and all the code that we learned are applicable to so many things and so many other projects. So we're still really happy with everything we learned. Should I help? So you have a car that moves your tone. What are you going to do now moving forward? Is it going to rot in your basement or do you want to improve on it? What's going to happen? Sorry, can you say that again? What are you going to do with your car moving forward? Is it going to rot in your basement or are you going to like make it into something even cooler? <laughs> 
Um, Emma and I are both going to different universities, but and this is more of just like a fun project for us to have throughout the year. Um, but like we do projects like this all the time. So I would hope that it wouldn't rot in my basement. Maybe I can like give it to my cousin to use or something. But um, for now, it's just a fun project for us to be able to do. Yeah. What was your favorite part of the process? That's a hard one. <laughs> I would say getting everything to work after after hours of it not working for whatever reason. When we couldn't figure out what was happening, and then we found one thing, and it magically worked. It was such like a aha moment for us that I think that was really fun to find. Yeah, even though it was a lot of stress before and it did result on a couple of floor sessions, it, it was a huge relief and really satisfied to finally see everything come together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, now being here and like knowing all of the work and effort it took, if you were to go back and you had to do this project, do you think you would still end up making this card even if you would have done something with more? <laughs> I think we would still go with this. I think the one thing, if I could like go back and tell like us in the past, like what to expect throughout this was to be okay being flexible in your project. We struggled a little bit with the idea of BBA from a drone since we were so excited about it in the beginning. But in the end, we still feel like we have a really good final product in the end. And like Mr. Combs said at the beginning, it's proof of concept. We got everything in our code working how we wanted it to, and it may not have had the physical outcome we wanted, but we know that it could have the physical outcome that we wanted if we had time to build a drone. So really just like after we decided on that car, our mantra was proof of concept. Yeah, Louis? If you could, would you do a tone controlled Tesla? A tone controlled Tesla. I don't know how reliable that would be though, you see. <laughs> we tested our car over in the corner and even just all the noise of all the presentations talking, it would get a little bit confused on where to go. So it works better in like quiet spaces. <laughs> Yeah, Jael. Okay, last one. How many tears were shed like overall? Too many to count. Imagine how the coffee aligned with tears. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. When you're talking about time management, how did you find balance between this and all of your other classes, extracurriculars? <laughs> <laughs> Our sleep schedules could be better. <laughs> um, senior year is already a lot to handle, but we find time. Um, like Mr. Combs said, we live in the STEM room. So after class, we would stay at lunch to work on our project. When it got closer to the end and we got a little more stressed about our time, we would come in in the mornings before school um, and all of our lunches and some of our off periods to try to do it. But it gets a little easier once you realize that like, if it doesn't have the outcome that you want, it's OK as long as you still like learn from it and try to get some sort of thing to work whether it's proof of concept or something that actually drives. And if you choose a project you're really passionate about and you like actually enjoy working on, it gets a lot easier to find time to work on it because you want to be doing it. And it also helped because there are two of us. So whenever one of us was having trouble, the other one uh, was willing to step forward and help out a little. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Awesome. Thank you guys for coming.